We're excited to welcome Amanda and Adam all the way from Munich, Germany. They're going to teach us how to make zoodles, which are zucchini noodles, and then meatballs. They sound really good, so we're super excited. So Amanda and Adam, if you guys want to go ahead and take it away, we've done our introduction Zoom selfie. We're all set. Okay. Sure. Um, so can you all see? We can start with the zoodles because it's a couple different steps. We'll do the zucchini noodles and then the meatballs and the sauce. Um, Kind of like one after another. Yeah. Can you get you that? Sure. You can stay I guess we're supposed to get back. Okay, we're getting back. So, I'm muted. The, the reason we chose zucchini noodles, um, well, our, my, my mom used to make pasta sauce a lot growing up, and Adam and I, um, back in the 2012, we found a cookbook, or we, you can tell the story. Okay. Okay. That's a very good story, <laughs> So yeah, we, um, we decided to do this like whole food challenge um, that's kind of like a paleo or Whole30, and we got really into cooking, and we bought this cookbook called Paleo People Who Love to, what is it? It's called Well-Fed. Well -fed. People Who Love to Eat. Um, and we just got really into cooking, like healthy food, but with like good food that we like, but with a healthy twist. Yeah, so basically, uh, yeah, so we it's, it's, it try to try to do paleo as much as possible. Um, in Germany, it's a little tough sometimes because if you go to restaurants, 99% uh, of the things they serve here are uh, bread or uh, potato based um, and a lot of desserts. Uh, so we end up cooking a lot. Um, so uh, we decided today yeah, to share um, our zoodles, which we make a lot. We actually don't cook them with uh, spaghetti sauce that often, but we figured um, another thing that we have found that's good about the food scene in Munich is that you're pretty close to Italy, um, so you get really good Italian food here. Uh, so we got, yeah, our pasta, our tomato sauce, our tomato paste is from Italy, and our canned tomatoes, and our, to our regular tomatoes also. Um, a lot of times we make pad thai with the zoodles. That's our the most popular. Uh, that didn't seem too, uh, too German. So we tried to make it a little bit more European centric today. So yeah, so we're going to make zoodles, then we're going to make um, some meatballs in the uh, paleo style without breadcrumbs in them. So there's a fun way to make them a little bit more crispy or whatever. Um, and then we're going to make a meat sauce with our other important uh, contraption that we have, which I'm sure we're probably not the first people to come on your podcast and say we love our instant pot. But uh, in a in a European kitchen, which if you couldn't tell is quite small, um, the Instant Pot is really a, a game changer since it doesn't take up much room and uh, really expands the uh, amount of cooking capacity you have. And your refrigerators here are pretty small. The kitchens are really small. So we actually bought, as soon as we moved into this place, we bought a second we refrigerator. Two refrigerators. So, yeah, we have this one and then the one that came yeah, with it. This one, which is built into the uh, kitchen. Wow. And some of you are on this fridge. Yeah, Amanda wanted to point out some people on the fridge here. Um, but yeah, as you can see, this is our entire kitchen and this is considered large for a European kitchen. Um, we had to get our landlord when we moved into this apartment to agree to make the kitchen bigger or we wouldn't live here because it started out only with this side. It this was, was like, this was the whole the kitchen. And one burner. And yeah. then they made so, it bigger. Um, yeah. So you learn to do more with less here, which is good. Anyway, so we'll stop talking and start uh, doing stuff. Um, so the zoodles, we started a couple of them um, before. But basically, you start with the squash. We use the yellow squash here we found is like more spaghetti-like because it looks like it. And I think it, it tastes. The flavor takes on more of the sauce rather than the green squash. Um, so we'll I'm going to show you some of those. Um, I know Lauren's going to show some photos uh, throughout also, but tell us where you like to get your fruits and vegetables. The name of the place was really fun funny. It was like Fruken Frocken or something like that. Or am I saying it totally wrong? The cooking here, I mean, the shop, the grocery shopping here is pretty fun. Um, so within our apartment, or by our apartment, there's um, a total of probably seven or eight grocery stores that are within a five minute walk. Um, so you kind of figure out which ones you like to go to. But yeah, 
So for produce, we go to this place called Frucht and Frucht. And so fruit, means, yeah, fruit and fruit. Yeah, fruit in German means fruit. Um, so yeah, it's just this fun little produce market, which is, I don't know, maybe a hundred square feet, if that, um, that you can fit maybe like six people in there. I think with COVID, they only allow four people in at a time now. It's our favorite place. We go there once a week, maybe more. Yeah, once or twice a week. We usually spend more, we have yet to see a person go in there and spend more money than we do uh, when we go in. Um, so our American supermarket habits uh, definitely uh, make us kind of stand out with the stores in, in Germany. And sometimes they give us a gift when we leave because we buy so much there compared to other people. And they'll give us like a free pineapple. Yeah. That's so cute. I love that. So anyway, yeah, the man is making the zoodles with this fun thing that my mom, who's on the call, bought us like six years ago. Sorry. Our a spiralizer. Long time ago. Yeah, it's a, a heavy duty spiralizer. It works really well. So you say, yeah, you put it in there and then turn it and it turns your zucchinis into doodles. You can see close up. Yeah, I can cut the right Yeah. <laughs> um, and we usually, like, when we're making pasta, we usually use like five or so, but it just depends how many you want to eat. And you can get close up to see it. There we go. Almost, right? Yeah, there it is. They so look, like, look like pasta. It's such a smart. Exactly. Man. Amanda, the pasta maker. It's great homemade pasta dough. <laughs> and then you get like a little thing that comes out with it, but we just throw it in because it's made out of the same thing. It doesn't look as pretty, but. I'm just And the next step, so when you will make, as we make the zoodles, however many you want to make, you, we salt them. You add salt to the, the zoodles and it, it sweats them because there, there's a lot of moisture in there. So you do it for like 20 or 30 minutes and get the moisture out and then you rinse off the salt. And if you've ever had zucchini noodles, like it's sore, but usually I feel like they're pretty watery. But when you do the salting, um, it gets the moisture out so they're, less water whenever you're making. Is anybody cooking at home? How many people on this call have eaten zoodles before? Yes. We've eaten zoodles, but all of my zoodles I've ever made were very watery. They are very watery. So it sounds like a very big game changer to, to sweat out the extra water with the salt. That only partially works. So if you want to make sure they have like no water, the best bet is to do it and then put them in the refrigerator for like two hours. Um, and that usually helps to get a lot of the moisture out. So if you don't have time to do that, something we found that works well also is if you cook them, and then all the water comes out, and then you just basically dump all, drain all of yeah. the water, and then cook whatever else you're making, and then toss them back in with the rest of whatever it is that you're making, and that huh. seems to make them a little bit drier. So but I we agree. always do it separate. Um, and like we don't cook them with oil or anything, you just cook them directly in the pan, and then get rid of the water, and then you can add the oil and whatever else sauce. You can make a soup out of this water. You can what? You can make a soup out yeah. of this water. You can make a soup out of the zucchini water. Yeah, we <laughs> could use We could use put it in our broth, replace it with the broth water. Yeah. All right, it's so the last one. This is a big upgrade to the one we originally bought, I think from Publix. It was like a hand turner. You can explain how that works, but you yeah. just had to like twist it in your hand. Yeah. I would say this spiralizer works 50% faster than the cheap hand one you can get from the grocery store. So all in all, a, a good uh, all right. good purchase. So now we have the finished product of Zoodles. So now we're going to... And mom, I know when you were, when I used to make pasta at your house to find out if it was al dente, you threw it against the fridge to see if it stuck. It doesn't do that here though. All right. <laughs> All right. 
So now well, these are salting. We'll start doing the rest of the meal prep. So yeah, then we have the um, the sauce, which we're going to put in here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the meat sauce. This recipe that we're using is actually, um, it calls for like a, a piece of meat, so a pork chop or something to be cooked in the sauce, but we're also adding meatballs, so it seemed just like a lot of meat, so we're skipping the pork chop and we're just doing um, the meatballs in the sauce. We had a spoon rest. How does Instapot work? Um, the yeah, Instapot, Instapot <laughs> sure. Great, great thing. So I'll, I'll give you a close-up of it. So we've got all these fun functions here. So it's got the, probably the best thing about it is that you can saute your food while you're also uh, then going to pressure cook it. Um, so currently we have it on the saute mode. So we're going to saute up all of the uh, sauce ingredients. Um, and then basically the point of it is that it's a pressure cooker. So it gets really, really hot um, on the inside and allows you to cook food in roughly probably half the time is what it would take in an oven or simmering it over a stove. Um, so it's really nice. It's also a slow cooker. Um, so you can cook things slow as well as fast. On the weekends, we actually typically use slow cooks. I mean, we make a lot of stews and soups. Um, and I don't know about the rest of you, but I think the key to making a good soup or a good stew is to eat it the day after you make it because it always tastes a lot better after it's been sitting for a while. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, during the week, having the, the uh, pressure cook option is amazing. Um, you can cook chicken breasts in four minutes. Yeah, like it, it's a Five real... or six or maybe eight chicken breasts sometimes we'll throw in there and make like shredded chicken. <laughs> Yeah, so. That's crazy. Yeah. You want to hear something? We've actually had our Instapot for almost a year, and my mom has been too scared to use it because she hears like, a, like you know, too much pressure, it can explode, and the whole kitchen will be ruined. So what's your secret to making no explosions happen so I can convince her to use it? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. I think it's pretty fail-safe. It's just this little thing. Yeah. <laughs> It, it, I, I agree. It gets, okay, so we, we did recently buy an Instant Pot cook. So the Instant Pot instruction manual tells you that you need to put at least 18 ounces of liquid in the pot with you in order for it to uh, get to the right heat. And I've had this fear that, oh, if I don't put enough liquid in, it's going to explode. But then we started making some recipes out of this other, this, this new cookbook we had. And a lot of them didn't call for that much. And I got nervous at first, but no explosion, so now I'm feeling a little bit more uh, emboldened. I think the thing works pretty well. Um, yeah, if you basically just, you turn the knob when you start it, and then once it's done, you have to make sure you turn it back when it cuts this yeah. yeah. All right. Once it's done, you turn it back, and then it, it, there's a button that goes up and down. Once it's up, then it, you know it's done, and it won't explode. Okay, thank you. <laughs> also, if, if I can be a shell for the Instant Pot one more time, um, I guess we, we, we bought ours. Uh, um, oh yeah, we bought it in it. We bought ours in like March, and uh, it broke like three weeks ago while we were cooking dinner for people. Um, and the next day, I emailed them and said, "Hey, this broke. Is there a warranty or anything?" And they said, "Oh yeah, no problem. We'll just refund you the money, and you can buy another one." So within like three days, we had a full refund and uh, and a new Instant Pot. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. Someone said they've been using their Instant Pot for 50 years and no issues. I don't know what happened with ours or how it broke, but it was, it's got it back quickly. George wants to know if there's a steam rice cooking function. I yeah. think there is. Yeah, there's a, a, right, there's a button just for rice. Yeah. And um, yogurt. Oh, you can take yeah. yogurt. Okay, we made some um, coconut, coconut milk, milk coconut milk yogurt. Yeah. And the interesting thing was, you needed yogurt in order to make the yogurt. You needed a little yogurt in order to make yogurt. At least the recipe that we had. 
like the uh, sourdough craze. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds you delicious. It, you, you call it a starter. The what? You call it a starter. A it's starter, a starter. Yeah. 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 We haven't gotten into the sourdough thing yet, but. <laughs> All right, we just added oregano to the sauce. And now the, um, I guess while these are cooking, while the onions are cooking in the oil, we could start the balls too. Yeah. There's a fun trick. So the, the recipe calls for, is a half a pound of beef and a half a pound of turkey, but we can't find ground turkey here. We really love it, it's in here. Um, so we're just using beef right now. I buy a beef. <laughs> so Germany does a good thing. They put on the label of their food, uh, the wellness rating of the animals that uh, you're, that are, uh, um, yeah, farmed or whatever. So each of this is like a national uh, rating system they have, and all meat has to be labeled with one of these four uh, standards. And it has to do with like how much, uh, how many antibiotics they give the animals, how much, uh, how small the pens that they live in are. Uh, I don't know. The website was all in German, so it was a good German practice for me trying to read it. But uh, yeah, it's good. It's a great system, I think, um, for talking about animal welfare um, and whatnot. So what does hinder uh, reich flesh mean? So rinder is beef. So rind is, is basically beef. And then hack flesh means, yeah, gr it's ground. So flesh is skin or meat. And then hack flesh means like ground up. And so this is literally just saying beef, ground, meat. Okay. And many times we went to the store and they sell mixed beef. They call it the mixed flesh and it has pork and beef. And I just grab the beef because it looks the same and I come home and it's the wrong thing. And I've done that like, I think twice, maybe three times. Does it taste like beef in the United States or better or worse? I think it tastes the same. I think steaks are better in the U.S. Yeah. But, um, okay. Yeah, well, let's do it separate. And cool. then you just have to put it separate so that um, and then you start to be full. Talking about, can you put the baking powder in yeah. the, between the tartar and before you put it in the wall? Yeah. So the next, we're going to do the meatballs. And you can talk about the, the cream of tartar and baking powder. Yeah, so this book it has like a trick about making meatballs. Um, it basically suggests that if you use um, uh, baking soda and uh, cream of tartare and mix it with water, that it creates like this kind of a crust on the meat, which kind of replicates, I guess, you know, if you were using flour in your meatballs, which we're not doing since it's not, uh, you know, paleo or whatever. Um, so the idea is that putting these, these things in together with the meat, um, kind of creates a similar um, it creates like a similar texture so it's like using uh, flour wood so we're just making this little dish of water um, and baking soda cream of the cream of tartare is something we have not seen in Germany well because we bought it online but this one came from Publix this is like the last thing we have from the US before everything's gone. You can hear it sizzle, maybe. Yeah. Bring it up so you get this Fun little yeah. concoction here, which uh, then creates, you know, kind of a crust on your meatballs without adding any flour. All right, and then for the meat so the meatballs, we're using the pound of meat. We're actually using half a kilogram of meat yes. <laughs> since everything here is on the metric system, which 
makes way more sense. And I am very, I think we're both very pro metric system at this point. So by now you don't have to do any conversion. You just know that grams and kilograms, what they mean. Pretty much. Grams and kilograms are easy. Uh, I feel like, yeah, and I don't, I think like the oven too, like Celsius and Fahrenheit, um, that's something I feel like we're just comfortable now. We know what we need to cook things on. So I don't even do the conversion necessarily. I just kind of. Um, we, we got on a, a minute or two late. Did you tell everybody what time it is where you are? We did. Okay. Yeah. We don't have much room. Yeah. By the way, by the way, I found online where you can buy actually cream of tartar. Oh, yeah, we got some. Uh, was it Amazon? Yeah. You can buy it in uh, Apotheke. Really? Oh, really? Yeah. At least uh, in uh, Munich, um, and uh, they call it a uh, wine. Oh, cool! You know how we call it in German, right? Um, this uh, the one we got says cream of tartar. Well, it's in in German. It's a allow um, pulver or wine uh, Weinstein pulver. Oh, right, thank you. That's great. Yeah. Hattie, you said your mom was from Munich? No, oh. I'm, I'm from Israel, but I lived in oh. Germany for some time. <laughs> Someone else said their mother was from Munich. It's Toby, yeah. Oh, my sorry, okay. Toby, um, where, I think my mom told me, was she, where, you know where she lived, like what neighborhood or area? I know, it's Frederikstrasse. Frederikstrasse? Yes. I think that's very close to us if it's the same one. Yeah. There might be a few, I don't know. Yeah. But, um, I like did her address and I did find her house, but uh, I, don't, I don't have it right now. But I, I don't, it could be, I don't know. Oh, yeah, I see her. She's smashing the garlic. Adam has very nice chopping skills, so I was showing you, <laughs> trying to zoom in on that. Uh, all right, so we're adding now garlic. What? No. We're adding garlic and tomato paste to the meat. Is there Italian tomato paste? It's in, it says one hundred percent Italian, so we believe it, but. that it comes like that so you don't here you have to buy the cake yeah oh i thought you were just cutting it um and then both the meatballs and the meat what Is, there, is this from? Is this from Italy? Yeah. So I think our, our balsamic is also from Italy. I'm pretty sure all balsamic. I think. Oh yeah, Italy. probably everyone. Both the meatballs and the meatballs have it. And then some parsley. Oh, yeah, I wanted to show. Someone said they're from Israel. Yeah, our basil, we just saw this today. Our basil is from Israel. I'm glad. And That's so cool. That's quite the journey it made to Munich. 
Yeah, it's actually it's a three hour flight. Oh, wow. Oh, so yeah. We'd like, to, for that. we'd like to go one day. We want, I mean, we've been to Israel, but we'd like to go from here. Yeah. Can I talk about your sauce? Sure. All right, so we're going to finish making our sauce. So another fun uh, paleo trick that we found is a lot of things that are, um, I guess, heavy, I, I don't know what the right word is, but uh, stew-like things that have to simmer for a long time is the use of cocoa powder. It's a fun, uh, it gives, I think, a lot of uh, flavor to things that have to sit and it's not sweet, you know, it's a, a good thing to, to cook with. Um, so we've made chili with cocoa powder. And uh, this sauce also includes some cocoa powder. So currently I'm adding some balsamic to our sauce, um, which uh, we stopped paying attention to for a minute and appears that there's some brown bits at the bottom of our pan. So we'll just yeah, scrape those off yeah. later. Um, and then garlic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It is already six. I just had an extra. The six cloves. We pre-chopped the garlic. But there's a. Well, we have to do the trick. All right. Is it garlic and then balsamic? You got. Mm-hmm. Okay. The broth. This is fun one. Where's the cocoa? Oh, right here. Yeah. All right. And the baking cocoa powder, we can't find the same stuff that we find in the U.S. Just like complete baking cocoa powder, but we found something that is close. So it might be a little sweet, but it's just baking cocoa, so I don't know why never think it'll be sweet. <laughs> there's no sugar in it. Does it change the flavor of anything? What, the cocoa powder? Yeah. I mean, I hope so. Yeah, Otherwise, I, it would be the point of putting it in. I think it does. You don't really taste the it chocolate. It doesn't taste like chocolate. Yeah. Because there's some, I think it's made it out of like kind of a powder. richness, I would say, to your, to your food. Um, yeah. We're going to let this sit for a little bit um, and, and come together. And then there's just a couple of, uh, couple of more steps. And this will be done in the meantime. We'll go back this. to the, the meat. This is wrapped Hi, Amanda and Adam. It's Nancy. And Stu wants to know, I came in late, so maybe you already said this. Hi, good to see you. What kind of beer goes with that? German, German beer. Ah, uh, I'll show you. So, yeah. So we have a this, this much beer, but then Adam has some actual beer he'll bring out. Okay. Thanks. You can only drink this much beer in Germany. A lot of people don't even give you the option of having less. That's pretty big. <laughs> so Adam's getting the beer. He actually was thinking about yeah, what goes well with the spaghetti and pasta sauce. And to, earlier today, we were actually at a brewery. We went oh. to this monastery. It's a, they've been brewing beer since I think 1450 something. Oh my gosh. But it's not even the oldest one in Germany. Yeah. So, how about you make this? Okay, I'll make this while you talk about I'll the talk beer. about beer. <laughs> Come back, she's talking about the beer. All right. So, this here, this is the, I call it the, the Bud Light of Munich. Um, literally, every Bavarian person drinks this beer. It's called Augustiner. Uh, the type of beer is a uh, Helles, as you can see. So Hell in German means bright. Um, so it, it literally means light, the bright yeah. beer. Um, so a Helles is basically, it's a lager. Um, it's a little, uh, it's most comparable to um, just, yeah, a standard lager that you'd find in the US. I mean, it's not a Pilsner. It's less bitter than a Pilsner. It's a little sweeter, um, but yeah, this is everybody's favorite. This is everywhere. Um, it's, it's pretty good. I mean, once you've had one, you've had all of them. Uh, they all kind of taste the same. So I could talk for like 30 more minutes about the Munich beer, 
laws and rules and everything, but the bottom line is that there's only uh, six breweries that are allowed to operate in, in Munich. Um, they have like a monopoly on the, on the uh, market. Um, and uh, yeah, so like when you go to Oktoberfest, you can only get beer from those six breweries. Um, but anyway, so this is basically what people drink here. It's the Hellas. And at Oktoberfest, each of those six breweries has their own tent that you go to, and you can only, yeah, you only get that beer at that tent. And they all make a special beer for the festival. Just pause and talk about it. Thank you. Oh, sure. We've got more beer to There's talk more about. more coming. But... Um, now we're going to finish making the uh, sauce. So we're going to add some broth. Um, so another fun thing about the Instant Pot is that you can make your own bone broth. Um, so this is homemade chicken stock that we that we made. Uh, we make chicken stock pretty much every single week because we eat like a whole chicken every week and then we save the bones. And then we roast the bones in the Instant Pot for about three and a half hours and then uh, you strain them out and uh, then you have broth. Um, so it's pretty, uh, it's pretty great uh, addition, and it really helps with not using food waste. Um, so now we just added broth and then two cans of toma fresh tomatoes, also from Italy. Yeah, all from Italy. <laughs> um, with the broth, we just made duck for the first time last night. We found it in the store. It was actually cheaper than the chicken which is very strange. So now we're excited to make duck broth. Yeah, we'll see how that comes out. So our sauce is done. Um, now we're just gonna cut it. You can see. Now it needs to boil. Yeah, so we're just gonna throw it in an instant pot for like, I don't know, 12 minutes maybe. There's no meat in here, so nothing actually needs to cook. So, uh, I want to show that. So the, the key, if you want to make sure your house doesn't explode, is this valve here. If it's pushed towards you, it allows the steam to come up and it vents. And then when it's pushed away from you, it's sealed off. Um, and then there's this other little valve here that will pop up when it gets pressurized. And as long as you don't open the lid while this thing is up, then you should avoid any uh, catastrophes. Um, so yeah, so we're going to make a... Uh, Probably a meat stew with less time because there's no meat in here. And we'll let this pressure pressure cook for you. Yeah, 14 minutes sounds like a good number. Pressure and that'll go and then we'll finish the rest of the meal. And the recipe that we oh, okay. the recipe we follow is a simmer for two hours. So we're just doing this to be quicker. Yeah. Okay, somehow the yeah. Um, all right, and the meat, they're just, the balls are almost done. They just need, we put parsley salt and just need Italian seasoning and then red pepper flavor. And Italian seasoning. So while we're on the call, I don't know if they'll, they may just be getting done, but. Yeah, all right, and we'll make these meatballs. I think we can do good, we'll finish with the zoodles, because yeah. the zoodles, cooking the zoodles will be to show like all the water coming out. Yeah. Do you want to continue with the beer? Sure. So we have just some other random beers. The beer, other beer that Bavaria is most famous for is a, a Weiss beer, which is a wheat beer. Um, you drink it in this kind of a glass. Not as big as the other glass, although it may look like that. I unfortunately do not have any in our house at the moment, so I can't show you a uh, typical one. Oh, we don't have a Weiss beer glass, no. And then the beer I drink the most is this one. It's a protein beer. <laughs> It's a real thing that they sell here. They're big on non-alcoholic beers in, in Germany, um, which we found to the kind of like, um, but I had to buy these when I found them. They're like literally protein shakes, but it's beer. I thought it was one of the most German things ever. So uh, yeah. And Adam brought this to work a lot. <laughs> yeah. Just drink them at work. And what beer goes best with pasta? 
Yeah, right. So uh, it's a good question. Most people probably drink wine with pasta, but um, if you were drinking a beer, I think one that does go well um, is a, a Marzen, which is the traditional Oktoberfest brew. Um, it's a little maltier than a normal beer. Um, and it, yeah, the sweetness, I think, sometimes helps to, uh, yeah, go nicely with the heavy red sauce. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's the Munich beer scene. So here's Amanda's uh, balls. They take 20 minutes to cook, so we might not, we might not have timed everything appropriately, but. Yeah. <laughs> So you'll just have to trust us that they taste okay. <laughs> and they'll be crispy on the outside. It's so interesting hearing this about the breweries in Munich, where in Atlanta, where I am, and many of us who are on this call, it feels like every other day before the pandemic, there was like a new brewery opening. Um, and it's like the thing to do uh, in the South. So it's, it's really interesting. Is there, do you know, like, is there uh, a movement to change that at all in Munich or it's just gonna be that way? There, I mean, there's a small movement. So there's a couple of small breweries here, like craft ones. There's one that is probably our, my favorite place in Munich. Um, it's like just any generic American style brewery, but um, it's the only one in, there's like basically three in the whole city. Um, so they're very, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I would think that it would be, but most of the, uh, you know, Bavarian people that I know uh, don't drink anything but Hellas. They won't. I've tried to give them other beers and I'm like, oh, that's not beer. It's terrible. Um, so I think there's a little bit of a, they're very traditional um, in what they drink. Um, so yeah, I, I think that the easiest way to say it, to, to really say it, is that when you go to a, any restaurant here, you don't order, you know, if you're at a restaurant in the U.S. and you say, oh, I want a beer, they'll say, what kind of beer do you want? Here you order, you say, I want a beer, and they give you, there's only two options. There's a, a, a Hellas, there's a Weiss beer, and then there's an alcohol-free beer. Or a Dunkel. And sometimes there's a Dunkel, but which is a dark beer. So that's it. You only get the two or three options. So it's very different in that regard. And Bavaria is very different from the rest of Germany in that regard, as we found in traveling around the country. Bavaria may as well be its own country compared to the rest of Germany. It's uh, a completely different place. One thing you always say is Bavaria is like Germany's Epcot. Like when you go to Epcot, what you think of Germany, it's basically Bavaria. Yeah. As as like ordering a Coke in the South. Mm -hmm. It's like um, ordering a Coke in the South. Everything is a Coke. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Wait, I love that. I was thinking that same thing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so now we're gonna finish up, I guess, with the zoodles. Um, so as you can see, just from sitting here, I don't know if you can tell, but the liquid. There's All a that lot liquid. of liquid that already came out just from the salt. Um, oh wow! Is just kind of like squeeze them. So you can we rinse them sometimes, oh, but yeah, I mean, if you don't rinse them, they'll just be really salty. But that's okay too. So if you want the salt. Yeah, so we should probably, rent. well, we'll take this water out. Actually, we could get this thing, like free shit. Yeah. Well, okay. Sometimes what we do, we use our salad spinner to dry out the zoodle, so. Very smart. We're not spinning them. Yeah, not spinning. Well, I used to spin them. You can talk about, yeah, squeezing them. Yeah. So basically, yeah, rinse all the salt off. Oh, we are going to actually use this? Not now. And then, if you want them to get really dry, I think just squeezing them with between your hands about, I don't know, for like 30 seconds, you can generally get a very good amount of the water out. Have you ever spun them in the salad spinner? We did. Yeah, I don't think yeah. it does anything. I did a little bit, but yeah, I think squeezing it is better. Um, but we do the same thing for eggplant. So we salt the eggplant to get the moisture out and the bitterness. And I think the salad spinner actually doesn't do much for that either. Usually we pat that dry, like this too. 
Yeah, if you just put in a little bit of work, you can get them to be pretty dry. And then another good thing about it too, if you're using your hands, is that the spaghetti, the, the uh, when you make the zoodles, they're very long because there's nothing to cut them. So you can kind of, you know, rip them in half as you're, uh, as you're going through it if you don't like to have very, uh, very long noodles that you need to eat. Okay. So I don't know if you saw, I should have showed you this beforehand, but I think the, zu the zucchini was like up to here when we dumped it in. It's like this high and now it's like this high because we, that's how much moisture came out of it. So. So that's five zucchinis there. Yeah. <laughs> Ta-da. <laughs> now for the last step, and we, we have to- We realize we're, um, we have this on our, currently over our stove, but we realize we need to use our stove for cooking the zoodles. <laughs> Any other questions on Munich or? <laughs> Lauren, you wanna show some of the pictures now? Yeah, I just wanna say, I um, have a little PowerPoint of some of the pictures you sent from like Oktoberfest, and then from the market too. Let me share my screen. All right, can you guys see that? Yeah, we can see it. Perfect. Let me go to three percent. Um, go to slideshow and then, uh, yeah, play from start. There we go. Oh, nice. You really put them together. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, 2019 was a lot um, busier. That's an example of inside a tent. Oh, that's inside a tent at uh, the bottom. Just one of them. They have so many tents there. And then the top left is Adam in his current outfit. Yeah. Just minus the shoes. Um, and the right was this year. We went, because they canceled Oktoberfest, we still went to a dinner um, just with like a small group of people. And we dressed up and had some beer, but just at a small table. So yeah, and like I was saying, the, uh, the, the, like that tent, the P, that's one of the six Munich breweries and you're not allowed to sell beer at Oktoberfest if you're not one of those six breweries. So it's kind of like operating like a cartel and uh, they make a lot of money. We've spent the last two years, we've spent uh, a lot of time trying to figure out what the economic impact of Oktoberfest is for Munich. And I think we came, we came across something that said it's something like over a billion dollars or euros. So, really sad there this year. They're, they're, they're yeah. hurting very much this year. Every other business. <laughs> <laughs> um, aren't there two new breweries trying to come in in the next couple of years? Confusing. Yeah, there's, so there's six right now, but there's a couple that have been here for a little while that aren't that big yet or aren't as big, but they're trying to go to Oktoberfest in the next couple of years, which will be really big for them. Mm -hmm. I think so, yeah. Oh, Bern. Um, this is the market that um, you all were mentioning earlier, fruit and fruit. And this is us buying zucchinis, <laughs> the yellow ones and the green. Yeah, the yeah, that's the size of the market. That's the outside. It's pretty small. Uh, they Every day they bring all their fruit out and bring it back inside and another picture of it. And that's a picture of um, a breakfast that's really popular here. So that was last Oktoberfest. Before um, Oktoberfest, it's the Frühstück, the German breakfast. It's vice versa, the white sausage that you put to peel the, the top layer off, and then mustard and pretzel. That's what we had last year when I came to yeah, visit. Yeah, right? picture last year for the Vice Versa Fresh and for October Fest. <sighs> it was delicious. I never thought I would like it, but yeah, it's just boiled white sausage and it's pretty good. Um, on the left, this is yeah, a veal. Uh, and the left is a, a different side of Marion Platt. So Lauren, your screen has a really nice uh, snapshot or shot of Marion Platt, the actual center. I was just coming home from a an appointment and this was like 
the view I got, so I took it and sent it, but this is just an, another side of Marion Platt, like off to the side. And on the right, that was Adam today at um, the, the monastery that we talked about that was from 1455. They started brewing beer in 1455, and we went there and had some beer and lunch. Adam, is your sweatshirt the protein beer? It is, very <laughs> observant. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why I have that. I still have some. They offered a promotion where they gave you the sweatshirt and we brought the case of them. Very comfortable Too much to say no to. So you buy the sweatshirt and the beer is for free. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's already getting dark in Munich. Yeah, when we started, yeah, it was light, and now it's completely dark. Yeah, yeah, it's now it's pretty dark. This is our, can't really see much out there, but. We saw it earlier. It looked really hustling and bustling. It looked cool. Yeah, you can kind of see the, the water coming, a little water coming out more, but actually Adam did a really good job squeezing uh, it, so I, I don't even see, no water left in here, I don't really so. see any water coming out. It's pretty good. And there you go. Cook it's, doodles. And take like a. A forkful. It's just like pasta. Just like it. <laughs> Couldn't tell the difference. And honestly, what went in the sauce, it yeah. feels the same. How did you cook them? Just drawing in a pan is usually how we cook. If we're going to eat them by themselves, I would usually add a little bit of olive and olive oil and garlic. Um, but yeah, you cook them on like medium or medium low for about five or six minutes. And then they usually get pretty. A long, a long Are they time. crunchy? Depends how long you cook them for. If you cook them for a short amount of time, they do typically stay pretty crunchy. Um, if you you can definitely overcook them, and then they get kind of soft. Hmm. Yeah, this is like a perfect crunch right yeah, now. I would probably like stop it. Yeah. If I were you. yeah. And then yeah, if we were gonna just make like this with butter, like pasta and butter, we could just add oil or butter now. But we're gonna add this sauce to it. The sauce is still boil bubbling, but I think the meatballs aren't going to make it. They have just like a couple more minutes left, so we can send a picture. Did you cook the sauce without the lid on? No, no. We have a little. Adam just took it. it off. Oh, okay. Um, here's the sauce. It's bubbling a little. It actually does smell a little like chocolate. A hint of chocolate, I guess. And then we'll add basil, the basil from Israel to the sauce. This is what the meatball should look like. But beautiful looking. Good to see everyone. Yeah. Great to see Stay you. Here. Do we well, yeah. So any other Munich, Germany, yeah. Europe related questions we can answer for you? We're also, if you know, not to, uh, I don't know, never mind. Like, no, I'm just going to say we have a pending lockdown coming in the near future. Um, so we'll be, we'll be, we'll be, back, we'll be back in the same <laughs> boat as, uh, as everybody else. I'm sorry. Except for Dave County, because they just lifted our curfew. Oh, oh is, is everything is everything good in Dade County? Oh no, it's getting worse. It's getting worse. <laughs> but because our because our governor said you don't need to wear a mask and you don't need to social distance, the they the business owners in Dade County went to court and the court said if the government says that it's okay, we can't make you do it. So wow. there you go. We're as bad as we were back in May. So Ay, ay, ay. Yeah. Welcome to Miami. Yeah. Well, Thank thankfully, we have this. opportunities like this so we can all stay home and connect virtually. And we'll just have to send everybody our Tradition Kitchens classes so right. we can have something to do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we'll make flyers we can hand out. <laughs> stay home. Cook with us. Yes. <laughs> yeah.
Well, thank you so much. This was really, really fun. And I know it was amazing for me to get to, to meet so many more members of uh, your, your family. And I want to really give a big shout out to Marissa and Marilyn, um, who along with Amanda cooked up this idea and, you know, planted the possibility. And it's been so fun to be talking about it and then making it happen. And, and special thanks to Lauren for all the organizing and publicity work you did. So thank you. Yeah, this Thanks, is guys. awesome. Yeah. This is really fun. Thanks for Thanks. organizing. Yeah. Man. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And Good job, job, Amanda and Adam. Thank yeah. you. This was fun. Thanks. Yes. And our next yeah, class awesome. coming up in two weeks. Uh, Lauren, do you want to share what people can come to? Um, and if there's anything else to wrap us up? Yeah. Well, I was just going to say we have an upcoming Halloween class coming up. Some of our masters are going to teach us how to make cookies, or I think they might be cupcakes. So that's really exciting. I can't wait for Halloween. Um, yeah, just check up on our social medias. We have our landing page with all of our classes. And thank you so much for me and Adam. This was a ton of fun. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. We really appreciate it. everyone coming together. Thank, thank you, Amanda and Adam. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. All right. It's nice to see everybody. Miss you. Miss you all too. Miss you all. Yeah. Miss you. Bye. Bye.